welcome. It's good to have you here for How Amazing is Grace, our series that we explore God's grace throughout the scriptures and how that impacts our lives. Tonight, uh, we will finally, more or less, finish chapter 15 of Luke, the parable of the lost, the three different parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost sons. I think it's lost sons, plural. Uh, last week, we discussed the return of the prodigal son to his father and how he did not repent before he came. He had a scheme that he made up. But afterwards, he turned towards the father because he realized he had broken his father's heart and he was welcomed by his father. And then he truly repents after the grace, the forgiveness is bestowed on him. Tonight, we're going to look at the next section of the parable of the prodigal son, and that is of the elder brother who is out in the field, who's not in the house, and the impact this all has, there's a lot of implications. It's what it's so amazing how Jesus in such a short story um, packs in so much, especially when we understand the cultural context of the first century and of uh, the peasant lifestyle that Jesus um, lived in. We understand those things, and then this story even comes more alive. Let's begin with prayer tonight. Lord God, thank you again for your amazing grace and how you not only extended and showed your grace to the prodigal son, but to the elder son as well, who was working out in the fields. And, O oh Lord, you show your grace to each one of us. Lord, melt our hearts, soften us, open us up to receive more fully your grace and to extend it to others, to be grace dispensers, to be um, subversive to the system in this world that is so filled with ungrace, with the judgments and the self-righteousness and the power plays of so many, Lord. Thank you, Lord God, that through your Son, Jesus Christ, you poured out the fullness of grace, that grace and truth came through him, as John the Gospel says. Tonight we ask, that you show us more of that grace and that truth so that we are alive to that grace and live graciously with others and for the sake of your kingdom. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're going to reread the last section of the parable of uh, the prodigal son, and that is Luke 15, 25 to 32. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look. These many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this brother, your, your brother, was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Wow. There's a lot in here. There is a lot in here. Now, the older son, <coughs> excuse me. Wow. There is a lot in here. There really is. Now, you have to understand the duties that the elder son would have in a family in first century Palestine at this time. The older son appears out in the fields. He has been working in the fields. He is also, by the way, outside of the house. He's not at home. He doesn't come in. He stays outside. Now, he does draw near and hears music, and immediately he should know what's going on. But he is initially suspicious. This is what Ken Bailey says in Poet and Peasant. He says, a son with a normal relationship to his father 
would enter immediately eager to join with joy whatever the source. On hearing the beat of the music, he knows immediately that it is a joyous occasion. Village rhythms are specific and known. The older son does not rush in as expected. He is unnaturally suspicious. You can already tell at the beginning of this section that the son, the older son, is alienated from his father. The older son had different duties, according to Ken Bailey and his research. The older son, as a custom, would require to be at the house greeting guests as they came in. Whenever they had a banquet, his responsibility was to act as the host of the feast, milling about with the guests. Um, I know this is kind of to the side, but in my small hometown, uh, family members have duties, unwritten duties, but nonetheless there. And uh, when my father died in 1997, a year after Elise and I were married, uh, at the funeral, uh, it was huge because my father had been a, a, a Christian school teacher for 37 years, and so children and grandchildren, and, and I mean, the, uh, so many in the town showed up. I think there were 500 or more people that came to the visitation, and one of the duties we had for the visitation, and as the elder son in the family, even though I have an older sister, was I was to greet everyone who came in. Everyone. I took a break for a while because, you know, it was a four-hour time period over uh, supper time or lunch time. I can't remember which. And so I went to the back and was uh, sitting down for just about 10 minutes to eat. And within five minutes, immediately, someone came in and said, John, your mother is looking for you because there are people out there that want to meet you. I had duties and I needed to fulfill them. And in the end, it was um, a pleasure. My father had done so much, uh, as teachers do, to invest in the lives of children. And, um, but the older son here has duties. You have duties in a family, unwritten though they may be. So he was to act as the host of the feast. The older son would start by greeting the people at the door and welcoming them in and say to the guests, I'm here as your servant. And many times the older son wouldn't even eat with the rest of the feast just to make sure that the guests had enough. And even if the son disagreed with the banquet, he would not show it in any form until afterwards, and then discuss with his father the situation to show true respect and honor to his father. But this son does none of these things at all. The older son instead chooses to humiliate his father by publicly quarreling with his father while the banquet is going on. His father has to come out of the banquet it's such a radical break that uh, Ken Bailey says it's almost as radical as the break that the prodigal son made with the father when he was asking for his inheritance. Ken Bailey writes this. He's, he, the father, is expected to ignore the boy and proceed with the banquet or in some way punish him for public insolence or at least demonstrate extreme displeasure. However, for the second time in one day, the father goes down and out of the house, offering in public humiliation a demonstration of unexpected love. So here he shows his elder son the kind of love he just showed his younger son. He shows such love. He shows such grace. He displays it. He does not come out in a huff. He does not come out with the accusation. He doesn't send a servant out to drag his elder son in. He himself comes out, and he himself humiliates himself. He does not play his position of power and authority, but takes the position of a servant to try to bring reconciliation. As Bornkamp says in his book, Jesus, here too the father comes out no less anxious for the older one and entreating him just as he had the younger one. Sometimes I think we think uh, it, this parable plays favorites 
between these two sons that the uh, father showed such grace to the younger, but not so much to the older. And in fact, the case is he shows grace to both, maybe in a bit different of a way, but definitely to both. And here you can see he faces real hostility from his elder son. There are a number of points just in this short, short, short section that Jesus tells the Pharisees and scribes and others while he's eating with tax collectors and sinners. When he's telling this story, the, the insolence of such a son because he doesn't address his father, first of all, with any title at all. He just says, look, you. Oof. You know? We're, we're used to being very informal. We're used to showing very uh, low respect for our elders in our society. We almost worship youth while well, we do worship youth. And we expect, uh, we kind of break down any image, any formality at all. And yet, even in our society, we can see kind of the disrespect this son is doing. Now, let me tell you, when I was out in California, I worked with a group within our church, about 200 members uh, that joined from a hill tribe from Southeast Asia called the Lahusi. They are, um, first of all, Asian. Uh, so they are much more... Um, culturally sensitive to hierarchies and to elders are treated with a lot of respect. And then secondly, um, they were from a peasant culture, so much more of a traditional culture than the United States. When they came to the United States, the older men specifically struggled with a lot of problems. One of the reasons they struggled was because um, they didn't know the language well, they didn't have a lot of skills uh, in our technological society and roles were reversed. Their younger children who went to school had to become translators. The power plays were reversed and children often treated their parents with such disrespect because they learned it in our society. They saw on television how children talk to adults and they saw in school how things were handled. And so when they came home and the adults, the Lahusi men and women were astonished and astounded at what was happening to their children, how they disrespected them, what they would never do and never expect. And Jesus in his culture was the same. So this son does not greet his father, does not call him father. He demonstrates the attitude of a slave saying, I have slaved for you. <laughs> wow. And he insults his father publicly. Do not expect that it's just the two of them out there. There are probably others that came out to see what the father was doing. He says, I've never disobeyed you one ever time. And he accuses of his, his father of such favoritism that you've never treated me the same. He declares that he's not even part of the family, that he has never had anything. He declares that the joy for him to have a good meal, that he never had that. He attacks his younger brother. He, he, he names the prostitutes, you know. But earlier in the story, Jesus never said that this man, this younger brother, wasted his money on immoral living. It's just he was wanton. So it doesn't talk about that. His younger brother makes him worse than he actually is. He accuses him. He also accuses his father of not really being a father to him, but a boss. And he refuses to come in. And he calls his brother, not his brother, but your son. He has cut himself off from a relationship with his younger brother. Saeed, Luca, um, a Middle Eastern commentator, says... 
He, the older son, shows disgust with his father's house. He says, that I might make merry with my friends. Thus, he is no better than the prodigal son who took his portion and traveled into a far country. The difference between them is that the prodigal son was an honorable sinner in that he was perfectly open to his father. He told his father all that was in his heart. But the older brother was a hypocritical saint because he hid his feelings in his heart. He remained in the house all the while hating his father. He denies any relationship to his brother and thereby denies any relationship to his father. He says, this is your son rather than my brother. With this statement, the older son removed himself from the sacred family and passed judgment of outcast upon himself. Wow. Wow. I don't know if you realize this. Jesus is telling this parable not just about Israel and about the situation in front of him, but I think about all of humanity. We are either elder brothers or prodigal sons. Jesus tells another parable elsewhere of two sons that were both asked to go out into the fields and work, and one says no up front, refuses to go, but later on repents and goes out and works. And the other says yes up front, but ends up not going. Do you realize that both of those sons said no to their father? And both of these sons are alienated from their father. This is humanity. The religious people, like the elder son, are, are only rule-keeping, are only following laws, but have no real relationship and no real love for the Father. They hate him. And Jesus is exposing that in the Pharisees and the scribes and others who are trying to keep the law. They look at the Father more like a boss. They feel like they're enslaved. They don't feel free, and they don't respond in love. And the Prodigal are the um, freewheeling people in our society, the self-expressionists. I want to make my own rules and go my own way. Uh, the lawbreakers, if you want to say, the hedonists, another way, whatever. They too don't want the father around. They just want his stuff. Neither son actually wants the father. The elder one wants his stuff just as much as the younger. This shows our human condition. But what it also is going to display is how amazing God's grace is. You see, the father responds to all of these accusations of the elder son as well. The father in his fury could have ordered the son into the house. But what would really be gained? He would still have a slave and not a son. And so he does not do that. He speaks no judgment at all on his son's actions, even though he could have um, castigated him. He only shows an outpouring of love, and he begins with a Greek word, technon, that is, instead of weo, son. This is a word that shows even more affection. It's more of a, like, um, young boy, my little, you know, you've always been my champion. You're my son. He shows such grace. He doesn't treat his elder son the way he des is deserved at all. He pleads with him. He begs him. And the father speaks and he appeals for the son to rejoice with his brother. He assures his older son that everything that he has is his. He is protected through pure grace and has been shown that to the prodigal. And so the older son gets the same thing. And the, the point is, everything that I have is yours. It's always been yours. You could have asked at any time. You could have asked at any time. Here's kind of the direction of the conversation. The older son says, you never gave me a kid. The father said, all that I have is yours. The older says, yes, but I don't have the right of disposition. I own everything, but I can't slaughter a goat to have a feast with my friends. Oh, the father says, I see you want me dead too. You want to be in control. You want to be in charge. You want to run it your way. And the parable here ends with the elder son still out in the field. 
and you almost wonder what's going to happen next. You can almost see the elder son being so angry with his father that he's ready to take a stone out off the ground and start to throw it at him and wants to kill him there on the spot. It ends with this heartfelt plea. And that's all Jesus is doing towards the scribes and the Pharisees. A heartfelt plea to say, hey, join in. Rejoice with me and with these others who are now in the kingdom. It's always been yours. Yours for, for the rejoicing over. So now we get a theological cluster at the end of this parable. I think parables are, have often been reduced sometimes. We've talked in a heavenly story with an earthly meaning, but that's not, or an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, but that's just kind of well, not much, no. And it's not just one point of comparison, but there are numerous, a cluster of ideas that come together to make an appeal and an appoint. So first of all, we do see sin in this uh, parable, but two different dimensions of it. There's the sinfulness of human beings, one who tries to keep the law but uses it as a wedge, and one who is outside of the law and breaks the law, but both are law breakers. The law keepers and the law breakers are actually both law breakers. Repentance, there are two types of repentance. One is a man who thinks he can save himself. The other one who knows he cannot. Okay? The one who thinks he can save himself can't really repent. You have to realize you can't. I might have said that wrong at the beginning, but now I think you get it. Grace, there is a love that seeks and suffers in order to save throughout and you see that grace comes first. Grace is given before the prodigal son repents, and grace is granted to the elder son. The father doesn't let him sit out there and stew. The father doesn't send somebody out to coerce him to come in. The father goes himself. And in that sense, there is an incarnational, an incarnational thrust throughout these parables. It takes the shepherd to go to find the sheep. It takes the woman to search for the coin. And it takes the father to run out to the prodigal. And it takes the father to walk out of the celebration to find his elder son. And it takes the humiliation of the father. It takes the servant nature. It takes the whatever it takes from the father. The father is willing to do anything and sacrifice anything for the sake of his both of his sons. There is joy. Grace brings about the attitude and relationship of joy. In fact, joy is the default mode of the kingdom of God. Church is not about a sourpuss place. It's not about um, a bunch of rule keeping. It is about God's joy, that he celebrates, that he rejoices in all that he has made, he rejoices in his relationship with us. He wants the best for us. He goes out of his way to make that happen. And sonship, that um, it has to be restored for both. It has to be restored for both. Here's the fascinating thing about this parable as well. Kenneth Bailey has a book, uh, in addition to the um, poet and peasant that I've quoted quite a bit from, another book called Jacob and the Prodigal. And in it, he shows that the story, the saga of Jacob in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, how Jacob went away, how Jacob came back, how Esau welcomed him, and how they sort of did and did not reconcile, how Jacob sort of uh, tried to pull one over on him, that whole story, that whole saga, is the identity of Israel reduced to that one person, Jacob, who has his name changed to Israel to struggle with God. And here we see that Jesus is retelling the story of Jacob to say to the people of Jesus' day, 
Yes, you went off into exile into Babylon, and now you have come back to the land. Like the elder son, some of you are outside of the house, though, and haven't come in. And others you treat as if they are the worst of the worst, and you don't even want to welcome them in, the prodigals. The truth is, no matter who you are, you may be in the geography, but you're not in the house. You are acting as slaves. You are not free. You're still in exile until you are reconciled to the Father. And I am the one who seeks and saves the lost. I'm the one who reaches out. I'm the one who's going to bring you all the way back home. So this is the way Kenneth Bailey says the same thing. He says, both of you are still in exile. Both of you are sinners. That is the elder sons and the younger sons. Both of you live unreconciled to God. The divine presence of God is with you and me, and I am among you calling on you to be reconciled to him. I'm eager to welcome and eat with both kinds of sinners. I'll eat with Simon and the Pharisee, and in his presence defend a sinful woman who makes up for his mistakes, her mistakes. I will also eat with Matthew, the tax collector, and his friends. I am among you in the landowner who pays all workers a living wage, irrespective of how long they have worked. When you accept being found by my costly love, you are authentically brought back from your real exile. And the lost are found and the dead brought back to life as you are reconciled to God. It takes Jesus to bring Israel into a reconciled, loving, full relationship with God. As for you, you were alienated from God, hostile to his works, Colossians said. I shared this this last Sunday. But now you have been reconciled in the flesh by his death, Jesus, in order to bring you to be right with God. Colossians says much the same. That's grace. That's the fullness of grace. And the kingdom of God is a party. The kingdom of God is a celebration. The kingdom of God rejoices over one sinner repenting, being found. Here's the order of things, and I think this is why I think this is so important today. I think we have lost a lot of grace in this world, as um, Philip Yancey says in his book, Vanishing Grace, that our culture and in our churches, we've become much more judgmental. Oh yes, we excuse a lot of our own cultural baggage and our own sins, but we become much more ju judgmental of us, them mentality towards the world. We want lawyers rather than prophets in the church, as David French said in one of his articles in recent years. Lawyers are those who castigate others, who blame them for all the problems, but exonerate those inside. That kind of character is not found in the scriptures. Well, we do get our prophets. Prophets are those who do show the faults in the world, but also look at God's own people and see it's there too. We can't do an us them. The Pharisees were doing that with those tax collectors and sinners. We can't do an us them. There's just an us. There is just an us. There are sinners. There are elder brothers who try to earn and try to control and still hate the father. And their younger sons, prodigals who are pretty upfront about their hatred for the father and just want his stuff. But then there's the father who loves and gives and loves even more. That's grace. And so we need to be more and more thrive as a church in our relationships. You know, uh, one of my, uh, professors way back 30 some years ago when I was at seminary said, you know, preach the gospel. 
That is God's grace in Jesus Christ. Why? People can get to hell well enough on their own. The law does not save. The law does not change people. The law hardens them. The law may convict in some ways, but notice even in this parable, the law only really convicts after grace has been given and shared. Because forgiveness comes first for Jesus and then repentance from us. In our series on Mark, that came out especially in Simply Jesus, when Jesus forgives the paralytic before he repents. Yeah, forgiveness has to come first. Grace needs to be shared with people first before they can ever come to understand the depth of their sin and have the possibility of repenting. Isn't this a great parable? There's so much in it. I probably have more, um, but um, we're going to move on from this parable and uh, look at a few more passages about God's grace and then uh, finish this series this summer and look to another series this fall. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for how amazing your grace is. We pray today and this week that you... Um, both shower your grace on us so that we can then give it to others, share it with others as it has been bestowed on us, that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your compassion and love toward us. And as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed your sin, our sins from us. Your grace goes well beyond, and we receive what we don't deserve. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for that. Where we are like the elder brothers, judgmental, works righteousness based, controlling. Forgive us and soften our hearts. Where we have been like the prodigal Lord and just wanted your power and your stuff and not you and not a relationship with you. Forgive us, Lord. Draw us more to your truth and your love. Transform us inside and out. All this we lift up to you, Lord Jesus, because you are the one who has given us the fullness of grace and truth. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for being with us.